those of us who were fortunate enough to be here last night, you will remember Father Peter Gerard uh, of the Order of Preachers talking to us, and the theme of his address last night was accepting the cross. And I went home in the car afterwards with the imagery that Father had left in my mind of the cross and the cross and the cross. And how when a priest is celebrating the Mass, the images that are available to him are of the cross. And Father will speak again today with the subject, Why Saint Dominic Wept, and about the holiness of the Mass. And Father just confirmed for me a short while ago that the traditions of the Order of Preachers, the Dominicans, comes from the early 13th century, from the early 13th century, and the habit that Father wears has never altered from that time. Neither, I think, has the Dominicans' appreciation of the sacrifice of the Mass. Father Peter Gerard. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. O sacred banquet in which Christ becomes our food, the memory of his passion is celebrated, the soul is filled with grace, and a pledge of future glory is given to us. You gave them bread from heaven containing every blessing. Let us pray. O God, in this wonderful sacrament, you have left us a memorial of your passion. Help us, we beg you, so to reverence the sacred mysteries of your body and blood, that we may always perceive within our lives the effects of your redemption, you who live and reign forever and ever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The prayer that I just said was written by St. Thomas Aquinas, and it is a prayer about the Blessed Sacrament that we Dominicans pray every time we gather together for prayer in the chapel. Now, it is said of St. Dominic, who founded the order to which I belong. He founded it in the early 13th century. It is said that whenever he celebrated the Mass, whenever he elevated the host and the chalice high in the air, people could see tears running down his face. And this afternoon, I hope to tell you why. Immediately after I was ordained a priest in 1992, I was sent to a parish in the country. Now this was a part of the United States where there were not many Catholics. There was only one Catholic school in the whole area and one Catholic church in the whole area. When I was to arrive, the pastor was anxious to have a new priest one of the things he wanted to do was to train new altar boys to serve at the altar. So he put a notice in the parish bulletin just before I arrived. It said, if you are a young man interested in serving at the altar, come to church on Saturday morning, and the new priest, Father Peter, will teach you how to serve the Mass. So that was really my first assignment. I arrived on a Friday, and Saturday I went over to church and I was happily surprised. I went in and there were 30 young men there, all anxious and eager to serve the Mass. Now, they ranged in age from about seven years old to 15 years old, and they all wanted to serve the Mass, all products of the Catholic school in the area. Now, before showing them how to serve at the altar, I wanted to see how much of their faith they knew. Did they know something about what they were about to undertake? So I pointed to the tabernacle in the church and I said, boys, can you tell me, is Jesus truly present here in the Holy Eucharist? Or is it just make-believe he's not really there? 
27 out of the 30 said, it's just make-believe, he's not really there. <laughs> now this might be shocking to you and to me, but unfortunately now it does reflect some trends. Surveys have been done of Catholics in the United States and ask them, do you believe that Jesus is in the Blessed Sacrament? 76% said, no, we do not believe. Interestingly, the same percentage said they thought it was important to believe that if you were a Catholic. And yet, somehow, they did not believe. Well, when I heard the response of those young men in church, something became very clear to me. That these young men, and so many young Catholics today, have either lost or perhaps never had an appreciation for the beauty and the holiness of the Mass. Just what happens when the priest stands at the altar at Mass? The Vatican Council said that the Holy Eucharist is the source and the summit of our whole Christian faith. That is, all the truths of our faith flow out from, like a wellspring from the Holy Eucharist, and when we celebrate it, it is the highest expression of our faith. So if we're going to renew ourselves now in this new millennium, the new evangelization proclaimed by Pope John Paul the Great, where we really need to begin is understanding this, the true beauty of the Holy Eucharist. You know, I've looked at, there have been a lot of so-called renewal programs over the last 30 years in parishes. I've seen them go in parishes and come out of parishes and Many of them have failed. And the reason being, if there is a renewal program for Catholics that does not have as its center worship of the Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, then it will fail. If the renewal program centers on us, the people or the priest, if it centers on me, it will fail. It has to center on our Lord, His presence in the Holy Eucharist. So how can we understand this better? Perhaps the best way I can do this is to remind you of something that you learned in catechism when you were small. We'll put it this way. If you're older than I am, uh, you learned it in catechism when you were small. Now, I'm in my mid-40s, all right? So if you're older than me, you more than likely uh, learned it. And Secretary Nicholson, I'm sure he mentioned about his mother educating him. I'm sure he learned it as well. And it's this important truth, that there are three parts of the church. Now, we speak of one church, but there are really three parts of the church. We forget this sometimes. Do you know there are about 1.2 billion Catholics in the world? That's not all Christians. That's just Catholics. 1.2 billion. That's a sixth of the world's population all of us together united around our Holy Father. Put all of us together on earth, and that's still only one-third of the church. That's the church on earth, the church of we struggling human beings on our pilgrim way. Remember in the old days, they used to call it the church militant, right? The church on her way to heaven. But there are two other parts of the church that are invisible to our eyes or at least most of our eyes. Someone out there might have a gift I don't know about, but for most of us, the other two parts of the church are invisible. The second part of the church are all the souls in purgatory. They're truly part of the church. We forget this sometimes. And they are dependent upon our prayers. They cannot pray for themselves where they are. In the old days, what did they call it? The church suffering. Now, you almost never hear a homily about purgatory these days, right? Unless you come to where I'm preaching. <laughs> I was giving a mission once out in the West Coast, and I gave a homily on purgatory. A lady came up to me after the Mass, and she said, Father, that's the first homily on purgatory I have heard since 1954. I said, did you like it? She said, yes. I just don't hear it. It's a shame, I think, because, again, they are dependent upon our prayers. 
Now, you all remember the late, great Archbishop Fulton Sheen. Hmm? The great preacher, radio, then television, got better ratings in the 1950s than the highest paid, most popular comedian of the day, Milton Berle. Uncle Milty was on one channel, Uncle Fulty was on the other. <laughs> and Milton Berle was afraid of Archbishop Sheen. Imagine that, a Catholic bishop getting better ratings than the top-rated comedian of the day. Incredible. Now, Archbishop Sheen used to say that when we in the church did not preach one of our truths, when we neglected, we the preachers now, not you, we, me, the preachers, neglected to preach one of our truths, the secular world would begin to talk about it. Because all human beings, St. Thomas Aquinas teaches us, are desirous of the truth. We all want the truth. And if I don't preach it to you, well, the secular world is going to. They're going to make up for what I am not doing. And because they do not have the full light of revelation, they will sometimes distort it a bit. You will not get it without error. You will get it distorted in some way. But they will make up for something I'm not saying. And it's certainly true concerning purgatory. Archbishop Fulton Sheen, for instance, uh, thought it, it, this was true. The reason why in the United States in the 1970s, hippies used to wear beads around their neck all the time. He said, that's because we stopped praying the rosary. <laughs> well, maybe. But it's certainly true about purgatory. We don't talk much about the suffering souls. And do you know, if you studied movies and television over the last 25 years, actually don't study movies and television, but if you had to, you discover over a dozen major films and television programs about souls that leave this earth and cannot make it all the way to heaven. One of these films was the number one money-earning film in the year 1999. The number one Hollywood film in 1999 was about a little boy who had the gift to be able to see souls that could not make it all the way to heaven because they were so troubled. And in the film, the boy talked to these souls, and after he talked to these souls, and they were kind of resolved what their troubles were, what happens in the film? The souls go to heaven. Now, this is pagan Hollywood talking about this, but it's a truth of our faith. That's purgatory. The souls that are on their way that need help and prayers on the way to see Jesus face to face. That is why from the earliest records of our Christian Eucharist, the very first rec written records show us we prayed for the souls of the faithfully departed because it recognized there were some that needed help. Now that's the second part of the church. What's the third part of the church? All the angels and saints in heaven, including our Blessed Mother. In the old days, what did they call it? The church triumphant. The church in heaven. They're the third part of the church, and we depend upon their prayers. Can you see how the three parts of the church are all interdependent? They all pray for each other. We depend upon the prayers of the angels and saints in heaven. They pray for us. So we have these three parts of the church, earth, purgatory, and heaven. Now, the reason why the Mass is so wonderful and so special and so awesome is because each time we celebrate it, each time the priest begins the Eucharistic prayer, and I know you're going to have Mass very soon, right after this, each time the priest begins the Eucharistic prayer at the altar, those three parts of the church that are normally separate break asunder from their natural confines and gather together around this altar so that we celebrate the Mass together as one church. When the Holy Eucharist is celebrated, there are no longer three parts of the church at the Mass. There is one church gathered around one altar for those moments. After the Eucharistic prayer, they go back. But during that most holy part of the Mass, there are no three parts of the church. They come together so that we can all celebrate the Mass together. Earth, purgatory, and heaven unite as one around every altar. And what's more amazing, 
because those other parts of the church are not limited by space and time the way you and I are, all of them are present at every Mass. Unbelievably so, but it's true. Around the altar you have all the souls in purgatory and all the angels and saints, including our Blessed Mother now, gathered with us when Jesus becomes truly present upon the altar to give us this gift of his body and blood. Remember last night I told you about the Holy Eucharist, how it transcends all time, the tree of life, the graces pouring forth from the blood of Christ transcend time to come down and touch us at this moment. This afternoon I'm speaking to you about how the Mass transcends all space. Earth, purgatory, and heaven unite as one around the altar. Now I'm speaking of this from our perspective, the only way we can understand it. The highest truth is the heavenly liturgy is going on all the time. When the priest starts the Eucharistic prayer, we are actually drawn right up into it. But because of our limited minds, the only way we can really perceive it is they are coming to earth to celebrate with us. And indeed they are. Do you know sometimes, I mentioned last night, I give talks to groups of priests, and when I'm speaking to them, if I see they're starting to fall asleep halfway through my talk, I, I try waking them up, shocking them a bit about the holiness of the Mass. I say, fathers, whenever I celebrate a private Mass, you know, if we do not have a public Mass to say, we will say Mass privately. Well, sort of privately, at an altar, somewhere, a chapel, a church, a small room, somewhere. I, told, I tell these priests that when I celebrate a private Mass, before Mass begins, I ask my guardian angel to come and to serve the Mass for me. Do you know they're ready to have me carted away somewhere to be committed? And I tell them, fathers, I'm not trying to make a de fide statement here. All I'm trying to do is convince you of something. You are not alone at the altar. Some years ago, I ran across a priest, a young priest, who was a student. He was getting a degree. So he did not have parochial responsibilities during his studies. I said, Father, uh, now he was young, 28 years old. I said, Father, where do you celebrate the Mass daily? He said, oh, I don't celebrate Mass every day. I said, oh, Father, you're in terrible spiritual trouble. Oh, why? What do you mean? I said, you must celebrate the Mass every day as a priest. The center of your life is holding Jesus in your hands. You, keep, you should not go a day without this. He said, well, I don't see why, because I'm a student priest. I do not have a congregation. So if I celebrate Mass, no one is there with me. So why should I celebrate the Mass? You imagine the talk I gave him? I actually started uh, softly, trying to... <laughs> and I told him about an elderly priest that I know. Now, I went to Providence College in Providence, Rhode Island. That's a Dominican college. There are 65 or so Dominican priests on the campus. I showed up there not sure. I wanted to be a priest, but I thought perhaps for my home diocese or something. If you show up on that campus and say, well, you're thinking about being a priest anywhere, they say, forget that, be one of us. Dominican. That's how it happened. I entered the order. My college roommate entered the order. And five of our friends all entered the order. We're still all here. <laughs> now, there was an elderly priest on the campus, Father Kenny, who was always so encouraging in a vocation. I can remember... I was thinking about being a Dominican priest. I was maybe 19 years old. And one of my jobs was to work in the kitchen for the Dominican priests on campus, washing dishes. It, I earned a little money that way to make it through school. And I was washing dishes one evening, and Father Kenny came by the dish room, looked at me, and said, I see you're wearing a white apron. He said, you keep praying, and one day that'll be a white scapular. I thought, well, okay, well, Father Kenny was a wonderful priest, 
And he was quite elderly. This is over 20 years now, me, me going to school. Some years ago, he became very ill, and he was in his 80s now, and he was starting to lose his sight. The doctors told him he would go blind. And Father Kenny was very worried. Why? He was afraid that once he lost his sight, lost his sight, he would not be able to say the Mass because he could not read the Missal. Now, he was beyond the age where he could have practically learned Braille and things, so he was worried. He went to the bishop and said, Bishop, I'm losing my sight. I'm going blind. Could I memorize one Mass? And that way, when I go blind, I can say that Mass from memory. The bishop said, yes, of course. He memorized a special Mass in honor of the Blessed Mother that he liked. Father Kenny became very infirmed, bedridden actually, and blind. For the last three years of his life, Father Kenny was in bed, in a nursing home. Every day, the nurses would come on a tray table and set up a chalice and a paten and candles. They would put the paten and the chalice in his hands. And from memory, blind, Father Kenny would say Mass on his tray table in that room. I told the young priest that Father Kenny was not alone. Whether a priest celebrates Mass at the high altar in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome or on the tray table of a nursing home, Jesus is truly present, and the whole church, earth, purgatory, and heaven unite as one around that altar. Well, that young priest is now celebrating Mass every day. You can imagine. <laughs> Now, friends, St. Thomas Aquinas, he was the greatest theologian who ever lived. Now, some people say I'm biased because he was a Dominican, <laughs> but he was. <laughs> he taught us that the Holy Eucharist was a little bit of what it would be like at the end of time. He said this because at the end of time, when Jesus comes again, now that could be five minutes from now, that could be a thousand years from now, we don't know. But when Jesus comes again, there'll only be one church. When he arrives at the end of time to close human history, the church on earth will be done away with. The church in purgatory won't be necessary anymore. There'll only be one church, the church in heaven, when all of us are, gather, are gathered around one altar to worship the lamb upon the throne, the lamb upon the throne that I spoke of last night from Ezekiel's vision and St. John's vision. That is why when we celebrate the mass, it is a few moments of what it will be like at the end of time. All of us gathered around one altar. Do you know there have been saints and mystics in the church given the gift to be able to see what is really going on at the Mass when most of us can't? St. Catherine of Siena, the great woman mystic, Dominican, was given the gift... <laughs> was given the gift to be able to see the third part of the church, the church in heaven, when she attended the Mass. And as she stood there, this is in Siena now, in Italy, when she stood there, she said that when the Eucharistic prayer began, she could see angels begin to gather in a perfect circle above the altar, right above the priest. And when the priest elevated the host, the angels with their magnificent wings would bow down in adoration. Padre Pio, Saint Padre Pio, you all know him, died only in 1968. He was given the gift to be able to see the second part of the church, the church in purgatory, when he celebrated the Mass. And he testified that when he was at the altar during the Eucharistic prayer, he could see souls from purgatory come right down the center aisle of the church to the altar to go see Jesus face to face. They would then come visit him later in his room, shut, gleaming with light, saying, Thank you, Father Pio, for celebrating that Mass. That is the Mass that allowed me to go to heaven. Now, it's not as if the Lord somehow gave superpowers to St. Catherine or St. Pio. No, the Lord just lifted up the invisible veil so that these saints could, had, could see what was really going on. This is going on at every Mass. Most of us just do not have the ability, or we're not given the gift to be able to see it. But the whole church is gathered 
whenever a priest stands at the altar to celebrate the Holy Eucharist. Friends, can you see why the Mass is more than a prayer meeting? See, prayer meetings are, are good, they're fine, but the Mass is more than that. The Mass is the joining of earth, purgatory, and heaven. Friends, when we realize how holy the Mass is, we, we should approach really in, in, in awe and trembling when we realize what is taking place at that altar. The Lord's really given me a wonderful gift. Do you know, I've been a priest now about uh, 14 years, and to this day still, whenever I celebrate Mass at the altar, I tremble at the thought of what is happening when I hold Jesus in my hands, and the whole church is gathered around. This is the beauty and wonder of the Mass. Friends, do you know, we have the custom of visiting cemeteries to remember our lost loved ones. That's a fine custom. But to tell you the truth, you can never be closer to someone who has left this earth than you can be seated where you are before the altar or before the tabernacle or before the monstrance in adoration. Because whether they are in the church in purgatory or the church in heaven, either one, it doesn't matter. They will be here to celebrate the Mass with us. When our celebra celebrant begins the Mass in, a, in just a little bit, they will be here to celebrate the Mass with us. Do you know there's something that I've encountered everywhere I've ever given a parish mission or a talk anywhere? Uh, I used to be able to do it much more freely. Now I'm a chaplain to cloistered nuns, cloistered Dominican nuns, and that ties me much more to the monastery. The nuns, of course, need mass every day. And believe me, I preach to cloistered nuns. I have to have a good homily every day. <laughs> Nothing off the top of my head. Every day I prepare a homily, a good homily for them. But wherever I gave missions, I encountered this. It was always from widows, always widows. They would come to me and say, Father, there are times at the mass during the Eucharistic prayer, not every time, but there are times in which I sense the presence of my departed husband seated next to me. And they asked me if they should go see a psychiatrist. <laughs> and I say, no, he is there. I know parents who have tragically lost their children to illness or tragic accidents or other means, and they sense the presence of their children there at Mass. Whomever you may have lost from this world, and we all have, we've all lost someone, whether it be your parents or brothers, sisters, spouses, children, grandchildren, whomever you have lost, know that when you come before Jesus in the Holy Eucharist, around that altar, they are present there with us. We are joining with them at the Holy Eucharist. Let me tell you about another young priest that I encountered some time ago, who told me about something quite unusual that happened to him. He was 29 years old, and he was assigned to a parish, and he told me that one day, during a Sunday Mass, during the elevation of the host at the consecration, as he elevated the host, he told me, that he all of a sudden became aware, it seemed to him, he said, that there were millions of people all around him, not just the people seated in the congregation, but he said there seemed to be millions all around, everywhere. And he said it was not a figment of my imagination. It was, it was such a real experience for him. All of these faces, all of these souls, everywhere. Now he said he only perceived it for about three seconds. Three seconds, that was all. And then he put the host down, continued with the Mass. After Mass, a group of parishioners came into the sacristy asking if Father was okay. And he said, yes. Why do you ask? They said, well, because something happened at Mass. We were wondering if you were all right. He said, well, what happened? They said, well, during the consecration, you lifted up the host, and as you lifted up the host, you began to, to look at, to gaze upon the host, unblinking, gazed at the host. You stood motionless, gazing at the host, motionless for 12 minutes. This priest, completely unaware, and what I told this young priest is, 
the Lord had lifted up a veil and allowed this priest, for the Lord's own purposes now, had allowed this priest to experience what is really going on at the Mass. Remember what I said, the Mass transcends all time, the Mass transcends all space, what did Jesus say? I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And so this priest was allowed to experience timelessness as he stood at the altar, and all space had all gathered around him for those moments. For him, it was three seconds. This is what truly happens whenever we celebrate the Mass. Do you know there's an old custom from the Middle Ages you know, St. Dominic, who founded my order, and St. Francis of Assisi uh, knew each other. The Dominican and the Franciscan order were founded at the same time. That's why we call each other cousins. Mm. <laughs> we both like each other, Dominicans and Franciscans. <laughs> There's an old custom from the Middle Ages that when servers, altar boys, serve the Mass for Dominicans and Franciscans, that they had to watch the priest very carefully at the altar. The reason being is Dominicans and Franciscans, when they were celebrating the Mass, would become so enraptured in ecstasy about what was happening when they were celebrating the Mass during the Eucharistic prayer that they would, some of them, would start to levitate, lift right up off the ground as if they were entering into heaven. And the job of the altar boys, for we Dominicans, was to grab the rosary and for the Franciscans to grab their knotted rope and to pull, keep them down on the ground. Father, you have to finish the Mass. <laughs> but you see, at times, this is what the Lord allows. He allows these experiences so that the faith of the people may grow. Now, friends, we are truly at a time in which there is a crisis concerning belief in the Holy Eucharist. As I said, 76% of young people under the age of 25 do not believe. The most wonderful thing you can do for a young person is to bring them into church and teach them how to genuflect. Teach them how to kneel. Teach them how to speak to Jesus present in the Holy Eucharist. Now, I give this talk to priests also. I tell them, fathers, well, you have to make sure people can see, at least see where Jesus is. I went to one church. I could not find the tabernacle. I went to the pastor. I said, Father, I cannot find the tabernacle. I said, Father, Indiana Jones could not find your tabernacle. <laughs> I want to bring people to see Jesus. Now, as I mentioned, I was teaching at the, and in charge of the college seminary last year, one of them. Now, the young men that I was put in charge of were the age that would be, say, the eldest of my children. If I would, right after college, if I would have married right after college and had children, then these young men would be that age. So when they looked at me, I'm basically, I was their father's age. Now, I told the boys, I said, we're going to do something, and we're going to have adoration of the Blessed Sacrament and benediction. The young men, who were, again, 18, 19, 20, 21, looked at me and said, uh, well, that sounds good, Father, but can you tell us something? Uh, what is that? None of them knew. They had not been exposed to it. So I said, well, I'm going to teach you. This is what we will do. And when Jesus was exposed in the monstrance on the altar, they experienced something for the first time in their lives, Jesus present to them in this way. And God willing it will make them better priests. Do you know, friends, when I was a boy, the pastor of our parish did something for me and for the other boys in the parish that I will never forget. We were learning how to serve the Mass as well. Now, I can remember being seven years old, riding my bicycle to church with my friends. These are the days when you could ride a bicycle and leave it outside unlocked, and you didn't have to worry. You can't do that anymore. We went to church, and a group of us boys, seven, eight years old, and the pastor began to show us the beauty of the sanctuary and the altar, the tabernacle, and what he said to us was this. He pointed to the altar rail in the church and said, Boys, do you see this altar rail? He said, That is the dividing line between heaven and earth. 
Beyond this altar rail, it's where God's presence is. That's like you're stepping into heaven. He told us how Moses, approaching the burning bush, had to take his shoes off because it was holy ground. He told us, boys, I want you to treat this sanctuary in the very same way. It's holy ground. That's when he put in his pitch for us to wear nice shoes and not sneakers. <laughs> he said, boys, you're to be reverent because Jesus is truly present in the tabernacle. He is here because he wants to be close to you. So we will show reverence. He showed us how to genuflect before the altar. He showed us the proper postures, how to conduct ourselves in front of the altar. Do you know that we considered it such an honor to be chosen simply to step into that sanctuary and to kneel close to the altar, we almost couldn't believe it. That, that we were given such a great honor to do this. We, f we were filled with such honor and reverence that we used to have competitions for reverence. <laughs> hmm? Who could stand the straightest? Who could fold his hands the best? Whose cassock looked the nicest? Whose shoes were most polished? Hmm? It was a, a military type of regimen, and we were proud of it and took great pride in this. And do you know if some of us younger altar boys ever uh, uh, did something uh, inappropriate or you know, disrespectful or laughed or something at the altar, the priest didn't have to correct us. Do you know why? The older altar boys would correct us. And if we younger ones would fool around on the altar or cause any kind of mischief, after mass, the older altar boys would come to us, say the teenagers, and they would say, uh, what do you think you're doing? Do you know where you're, do you know the honor that you have been chosen for, so you shape up or we're going to ship you out. And we listened to them, and we did not fool around anymore. I remember the first day learning about the altar and the tabernacle, riding back home on our bicycles. My friends and I were speaking, and we said to each other, we said, can you imagine being near the tabernacle when the doors opened? We were convinced that we would die <laughs> from the radiant streams of grace flooding forth from behind those golden doors. Out of the mouth of babes, we say, right? Because it's all true. Jesus does live in the tabernacle, truly. The sanctuary is holy ground. The three parts of the church are gathered together around the altar when the priest stands there. And Jesus, the, his radiant streams of grace do proceed from behind those golden tabernacle doors. And if you and I could see those radiant streams of grace, we would die. We would be taken up to heaven immediately if we could see his glory streaming from behind the tabernacle, from the monstrance, from the hands of the priest during the Mass. It is said that St. Dominic, who founded my order, that whenever he celebrated the Holy Eucharist, whenever he elevated the host and chalice in his hands at the Mass, people could see tears running down his face. And now you know why. May every Mass that you attend transform you. May you come before the altar now in a new way with awe and reverence for Jesus, truly present amongst us. And think about taking a young person into church and teaching him or her what I have told you today. God bless you.